Hello, I am Halsey Lion. It's been a while since we've seen each other, huh? Yeah, I've been having some problems which kept me away from making videos, but those problems are nearly over, so it's time for the content to resume. So, welcome back to Bandit's Ballads. The first five chapters saw Balon Blacktide evolve from a naked and unarmed looter into the leader of a fearsome gang of bandits who just finished raiding their first caravan. But despite our recent string of victories, I have not yet managed to fulfill the last goal I set for myself, and that is getting 50,000 dinars in the bank. We're almost halfway there, so this shouldn't be too difficult. I already have plenty of loot for sale, so if I could sell it into a town I'd probably achieve my goal right then and there. Alas, because I'm an outlaw, the markets are closed to me and the only thing I can do is try to sell my plunder piece by piece in each of the villages I pass through. But because this can take a while, by the time I'm done selling everything, all the money I should have earned will have gone to my soldiers because they require their wages paid on a daily basis. Oh well, best thing I can do for now is head over to the nearest horse ranch and exchange a bit of loot for some of their mounts. Five of those were worth 1400 dinars and in addition to that, the villagers gave me another 900 in exchange for the stuff I gave them, but after that transaction I uh, didn't really have a sense of direction other than a vague feeling that I should keep raiding people. So I wandered around for a while until I ran into a bunch of looters whom I didn't even bother fighting despite the fact that I could use the combat practice. Instead, I just sent my soldiers to deal with them. As my men returned victorious, they brought the surviving looters in front of me and asked whether we'll bother taking them captive. I said let them go and one of the survivors said, Thank you, Lord Blacktide. First of all, you're welcome and second of all, How do you know my name? I asked him. To which he replied that when a black flag appears out of nowhere and starts raising hell, people are going to ask questions. As for who provided the answers, this looter said something about some escaped prisoners who were running out of Vlandia. In other words, my clan is becoming more renowned, which in turn should allow me to amass a bigger horde. Thing is, if I want my crew to get bigger, I have to actually get out there and recruit more people. And what better way to do that other than going through villages and conscripting their fighters? Having set an actual goal for myself, I made my way to Etterford, where six Vlandian lads were coerced into joining us, along with two of the bandit prisoners we were dragging along. Then I decided to venture into Batania, eventually arriving in the village of Abkomer where in order to convince the locals to lend me some troops, I promised that my fight is against Vlandia, which isn't too far from the truth. I have said it before and I'll say it again. I'm getting sick and tired of fighting the Vlandians. I crave new victims. Anyway, seeing how the Batanians are already at war with the Lions of the West, some of the lads were willing to join me, but their landlords said no and sent their militia against us. In a valiant act of self-defense, we put a stop to these authoritarian attempts at controlling these young men's future. If they wish to fight the enemies of Batania by my side, nobody should stop them. And so, five more Batanian fighters joined my anti-Vlandian task force. Then I've done the same in the village of Lanokhen and I was going to keep doing it in the next village as well. Unfortunately, a Batanian noble took notice and began chasing us off his lands. My newest priority was to get this bastard off my trail so I can keep recruiting people for my war against Vlandia. While being pursued, I eventually arrived in the village of Svenrin, whose inhabitants were headed to the local market with a lot of horses, so you know what that means. It means I was going to let them go in peace, even if I wasn't being chased by that lord. I gave them my word that in exchange for allowing me to buy their horses, I would offer my protection. Well, the only thing I can protect them from is my own wrath, so I shall not raid them. It's the best I can do, I can't possibly defend them from entire Sturgeon armies if they intend to trample these lands. Maybe that shall be my duty when I own this fiefdom. 
But I digress, we were speaking of horses. And in regards to that subject, I did purchase as many as they had in the village, after which I kept running away from the lord that was hunting me, with the intention to also visit my friends in Glintor and buy whatever mounts they had available. But the villagers of Svenrin were desperate to run away from me, even though I promised them my protection. They may not believe me, and they have no reason to, I am an outlaw after all, but this is the only promise that I intend to keep. Anyway, in Glintor, I paid nearly 2000 dinars for 9 more horses and then went towards the nearby village of Neviansk, which was under Vlandian occupation. Unlike the previous couple of settlements, this one bears no significance to me, so I had no qualms about putting its militia to the sword if they opposed my conscription request. Luckily for them, they did not, and six more sturdy Sturgians joined the fight against their oppressors. But because this village was Vlandian property and the Batanian lord abandoned his pursuit, I was free to put it to the torch in order to inflict more damage on this kingdom, for reasons I've already explained in the previous chapter. To refresh your memory, I basically want to force the Vlandians into a truce where they pay me a lot of money to leave them alone. The raid was going rather well, but what I failed to realize is that the nearby castle was under siege, and when the Batanians captured it, the ownership of the settlement has changed and I did not want to mess with the forest people just yet. You know how overprotective of their lands these nobles can be. And if a castle was taken, then that means a huge army is coming right for me, so it was time to abandon the raid and get out of there as fast as I could. That's not a problem. There's many other Vlandian villages for me to raid, such as Kaleus, whose notables were also kind enough to lend me nine more soldiers to help me burn it down. They were reluctant, of course, because these are their homes. But they'll get a taste for it in time, once they realize just how profitable this is. After almost three days, Kaleus was reduced to a smoldering pyre and I set off towards Deriat, which was defended by 44 people. This village, however, was one I wouldn't raid. Not out of the kindness of my heart, but because if I start something and some lord comes to its defense, there will be no way out, as has already been demonstrated about a month ago. Even so, I'll still fight the local militia if they don't comply with my conscription request. The tricky part is dealing with the possibility of losing more people than I can recruit. So in order to avoid that, I had to join the fight and lead the soldiers myself, instead of letting them to their own devices. As you already know, I like to keep things simple. So I split my archers in two different groups and then placed them on a hill, one in front of the other. They would be the main damage dealers. The footmen were placed in a shield wall behind one of the houses, standing ready to pounce on the enemy spearmen as soon as they made their approach. As for the cavalry, they'd just stand by until the enemy infantry gets routed, at which point they will charge at the archers and quickly wipe them out. As for Balon himself, he went towards the archers and prepared to fight them on foot, and to his credit, he did manage to kill one of these guys, but he suffered an allergic reaction to the fiber-rich diet of bolts he was served. So he passed out due to anaphylactic shock, and it was up to his men to finish the job. They eventually did, but seven of them have paid with their lives, so all I could hope for is that we'd conscript more people than we've lost. We kind of did, and with these men taken under my banner, I was now headed over to Vlandia, intent to cause a lot more damage to its infrastructure. That's the most surefire way of getting a lot of money and reaching my initial objective. For now, I was more concerned with expanding the size of my crew, so that we wouldn't piss our pants the moment some lord's retinue shows up. The lads from Druimor volunteered to join up, and with them on board, I had to descend towards the Westerlands. But in my path, a curious sight. A fight between serfs and bandits, or rather, an opportunity for my gang to grow even richer when we attack whoever wins this fight. But before that was over, I noticed something else in the corner of my eye. A Vlandian banner carried by a party of 43 soldiers. Since I have 83 warriors, I can definitely take them on. 
but they weren't going anywhere. So I waited for the bandits to win, ambushed them, took everything they owned, which didn't even add up to the daily wage of my crew, and then turned my gaze towards what was certainly a bigger score. Unfortunately for them, their leader chose the worst way imaginable to make his escape. Running through a forest. Tisk tisk tisk. When I eventually caught this lord, I didn't just attack him like I was a rabid dog. We first greeted each other, introduced ourselves, and I even received a compliment about my valor and honor, which is rather strange, seeing how the only things I'm known for are extortion, robbery, and raiding. Is he being sarcastic? On second thought, I don't care. The only thing I cared about was how much money Ospier was willing to pay me. On one hand, to let him go, and on the other, to stop raiding Vlandia. I'm a reasonable man. I'll only take everything he carries. Not a dinar more. He did offer to pay me nearly 25k, but that's... not everything, so I had to decline and engage him in a fight. When the battle began, I organized my men into their standard formations. Infantry in a shield wall, archers spread out, and cavalry protecting the rear. Then I advanced towards the enemy. Not because I wanted to fight them by myself, but because I wanted to figure out the best spot to place my men. If I could position my archers up on that ridge, have the cavalry protect them and keep the infantry fighting in the field below, we could probably cause some serious devastation, but I wasn't too sure. Before I made up my mind, the enemy cavalry was making its approach and I tried my best to turn back and get out of there, but I was too slow and Ospir caught up with me, with his sword poised to strike. And not only was he faster, but he also was more cunning because he made his approach from my left, but just before he struck, he quickly went to the right, and by the time I turned my shield to block the incoming attack, it was already too late and I got a portion of my turban sliced off and sent flying. The reason I put it on in the first place was to keep me luck, and it seems to be working because if the sword hit just a little lower, I'd have been a dead man. For now, I was just unconscious and humiliated by a lord I could have easily defeated in single combat. Next time we meet, I will make it my personal mission to strike Ospir down with my own hands. Because of this bit of misfortune, what was supposed to be my greatest battle yet has been reduced to the stories my men relayed to me. To boil it down to its essentials, the fight went more or less the same way I'd have managed it. The archers gave each other room and did what they do best, the infantry formed a shield wall and went in front of them, and the cavalry would roam around the battlefield, confusing the hell out of our enemies and picking off strays. While holding their position, the archers managed to hit Ospir as well as destroying most of his cavalry. And shortly after that, everyone approached the bulk of the enemy force until they were given no choice but to come to us. When the enemy closed in, my footmen went into a frenzy and started killing everything that stood in front of them. In just a few seconds, the enemy infantry got routed and my men advanced towards the Vlandian rangers who, to their credit, inflicted heavy damage before they too were sent running. At this point, all that was left were a few stray horsemen who did manage to catch my archers undefended, but eventually met their demise at the end of my infantry's spears. Before long, the last of the remaining cavalry realized that their speed would serve them better in their escape, and when they decided to flee, victory was declared. Not my victory. This one was earned entirely by my men. When it was all over, some of my soldiers tended to my flesh wound, and the others brought Ospir in front of me. Now, what could I do with this lord? I could let him go, have him spread the word about how honorable I am, and improve my standings with his clan. Or I could imprison him. He wasn't the only one I captured. I also had to release the poorest among my prisoners to make room for the knights that this lord was leading. The more expensive the troops, the higher the ransom. 
Speaking of Ransom, that's what I was intending to do with Ospier as well. Fortunately, I don't have to sneak into a town and talk to a Ransom broker because the noble houses of this realm tend to send couriers with large sums of money to free their relatives. All I had to do was wait. Well, I wouldn't just wait. I also needed to go on more raids and let the Vlandian lords know that I require more than 25k if they want me to stop. But I suppose you'd also like to know what I got from this fight? Alright, I'll tell ya. First of all, I got another Vlandian Courser which would fetch me a good chunk of money if I found a proper buyer. I also found a leather scale armor which reminded me of those usually worn by the Lords of the Riverlands. Because it was much better than what I was wearing, I did not hesitate equipping it. Same was true for the male mittens, cavalier boots and padded cap that I found in the pile of loot my men have thrown at my feet. Last but not least, I got a lance that I might use at some point in the future. Especially if I'm about to fight cavalry. Of course, the loot pile contained more trinkets, but they have no other use other than being sold. So there's no point in talking about it. Once this loot was added to my collection, I needed to replenish the strength of my party and as you already know, the best way of doing that was by conscripting more battalions. After all this fighting, a lot of my men were trained and ready for their promotions, so I spent nearly 700 dinars on that and then set course towards Vlandia, at the same time waiting for a courier to bring me ransom money for Ospir, but he would never come because my hostage slipped away when my men were distracted. Oh well. Not long after, we've entered the village of Ormanfard, whose notables graciously offered me six more fighters before I decided to burn it down. But just as I was getting me torch ready, one of my riders reminded me of a promise I made not too long ago to the people of this village. No raids for two years in exchange for the loyal service of the people I've conscripted from here. I remember now. This horseman must be one of the fellows I've taken from Ormanfard a short while back. Oh well, a promise is a promise, especially if it was made to my own soldiers. So I spared this village for the time being and set sail towards the next one, where I've made no such promises. As I was traveling towards the next village, something else grabbed my attention. A Vlandian caravan. Seeing how the last one was so profitable, I obviously wanted to attack it, but even through a forest, its speed rivaled my own. But while chasing the caravan, I got distracted by an easier target. A party of Vlandian soldiers who no longer served any lord. They did not want to fight me, they just wanted to return to the nearest city and find someone else to serve, but I was curious to know what happened to them. Now, they did not outright tell me, but they were carrying the banner of House de Molarn, and the only member of that house that's perished is Peric. He died in a battle a couple of days ago, while I was busy getting my skull sliced, and the remainder of his troops were now returning home. But they'd never reach their destination at least, not with all that gear they're carrying. The skirmish would have been easier if the militia of the nearest village didn't join the soldiers, but even so, I could handle all of them. You already know how I fight in rural environments. Infantry takes cover behind a house, archers get placed further back, and cavalry stays away until the enemy rangers are exposed. The same was done for this fight and it went just as well as I was expecting, and I even managed to score a few kills with my axe. Although I did get injured by a few crossbow bolts. When it was all over, we lost 5 soldiers but the enemy was carrying 7 prisoners who collectively decided to join me. As for the loot, we didn't get anything special, just some random gear that I was going to sell. But because the local militia died trying to protect those deserters, their village was now defenseless and thus an easy target for a raid. So I went in and did what I was supposed to do, but not before convincing their best warriors to join my crew. As the smoke was beginning to rise, a Vlandian lord came to the defense of this village, but his 73 soldiers couldn't hope to do a thing against my 90. 
so I halted my raid and went towards him, just to give him a scare. It took a bit of time to chase him off my territory, but once this little bitch got the message that he can't do shit, I went back to continue the raid. Mere moments later, another lord came by. Lukand and his party of 74. Another bunch of losers I could scare off my territory. So I took after him, trying to do the exact same thing I've done with Belgir, but as I went north, another lord with 93 soldiers showed up behind me. Well, Lukand is too scared to follow me, and the one behind me won't engage without his help. All I had to do was head north, cross the bridge of Ormanfard, and run into the open plains of Vlandia. Or so I thought, before another army of 200 set itself in the middle of my path. Change of plans. I'll go south, Adaltrud will run from me, and with her out of the picture, I can wiggle my way out of here. By this point, however, the parties of Lukant and Belgir teamed up and emboldened each other into chasing me. As for Adaltrud, she was scared to engage in a fight, but as she saw friendly banners approach, she eventually attacked me and the other two parties joined in. I could absolutely not fight 270 soldiers with just 92. Well, I could in theory, just not with these 92. But I had a way out. I could sue for peace and accept the 7000 dinars I was being offered. Maybe I should have accepted Ospier's 25k, but I didn't do it because I thought I could get more. And because I still believe that, I will refuse the 7000 and instead give my men the best goddamn speech they've ever heard. We are ironborn! We do not retreat! We do not surrender! Today we may fall, but what is dead may never die, but rises again, harder and stronger! Charge! Inspired by these words, the bravest of my soldiers rushed forth, with nothing but the thirst for blood to give them courage. But some of my men were a bit hesitant and to them I said, Not you, let's get the fuck out of here before the Vlandians realize what we're up to. And so we made our escape, but it extracted a heavy toll. 26 of my bravest soldiers, a large portion of my inventory and a few horses were sacrificed so that the rest of us may escape from this impossible situation. Is this cowardly behavior? I would say it is as cowardly as waiting for reinforcements when you already outnumber your enemy. Let's just agree that this was the smartest way to salvage the stupid situation I got myself into. As I made my escape down south, another nobleman blocked my path, Arthamund and his 91 men. Luckily for us, he was too afraid to fight my 66 without reinforcements, so he graciously moved out of my way and I was allowed to go free without having to sacrifice more of my crewmates. Shortly after, we noticed a gang of 27 looters and because my men could use a morale booster, they were allowed to vent their frustrations on those poor sods. But somehow, one of my battalion elite sharpshooters and an imperial horseman got themselves killed against this riffraff. Don't ask me how, because when I lead fights against looters, there's no casualties. Not when I have elite archers to shoot them before they even reach our front lines. But after that fight, I was not in the clear. Because Adaltrud's 93 were still hot on my trail. So I ran through a forest in an attempt to lose them. But I didn't need to solely focus on escaping, I could take a break every once in a while to put more bandits down. Such as this gang of 43 who managed to merge with another 6. If 27 looters were able to kill 2 of ours, surely 49 of them would inflict a lot more casualties, right? Nope. Somehow, not a single one of my warriors died in this battle, although six of them got heavily injured and would need to heal before they were back in fighting shape. As for the money and the loot we got from them, it would be a waste of time to mention from now on, seeing how the maintenance cost of my crew is higher than whatever these boys could scrape together in a lifetime. Anyway... Just as my noble pursuer was abandoning the chase, I've spotted the king of the Vlandians, their third, leading a party of 113. I could definitely not take him on, not unless I bring my warband back to full force, but maybe I could do something else. 
For this something else, I'd still need a lot of people, so I went to the nearest village, forced three peasants to join us, and then started raiding it to get their third to respond. He did not, but another lord bearing the lion banner of Vlandia came by and started chasing me. So I ran as fast as I could, because my 60 men couldn't defeat 130, especially if these other 98 join in. For now, all I could do was travel north and try to get these lords off my trail, but eventually, I saw the king himself once more, this time at the helm of a much larger retinue. And even though I may not have enough people, now it was time for that something else I've talked about. So I grabbed their third's attention and went further north, where I was sure no other lords would intervene. Then I simply allowed him to catch me, and when he did, we finally talked face to face, introducing ourselves to each other and exchanging a few words, such as him telling me that raiding villages is cruel, please don't do that, as if he and his cronies don't burn settlements for fun, the hypocrites. I didn't call him a hypocrite to his face though, as it would have had a negative impact on what I was trying to accomplish. You see, I am tired of Avlandia. I've been terrorizing these lands for four chapters in a row, and if I have to see any more red banners, I'll lose my mind. They remind me of the Westerlands and their Lord Paramount. His house too had a golden lion embroidered on a red banner. What are the odds, eh? Anyway, I can't get out of Vlandia until I get paid for my trouble and so, I decided I'll ask King Der Third, his grace, long may he reign, how much is he willing to pay me to bring my raids on his nation to a halt. Now, he has more soldiers than I do, so why would he pay me if he can just whoop my ass? That's a good question. The problem is, I won't just stay for my ass whooping when I can simply sacrifice a few of my men to make my escape, and then keep burning Vlandia until it is reduced to a smoldering pile of cinders. With this in mind, their third offered to pay me 39,814 gold coins. That's a weird looking number, let's make it a nice round 40,000. The king said he can't give me that unless I throw in a couple of trinkets, and so I did. A shield and a couple of pieces of armor are worth a lot more than the extra 200 I took from their third, but it's a small price to pay to get 40,000 dinars, which got me to my target of 50,000 and brought some measure of peace to the western lands of Vlandia. No longer shall these people be terrorized by the black flag of the Ironborn, unless their king decides to declare war on my clan. Why would he do that after paying such a heavy price for peace? He may be pressured by his vassals into taking stupid decisions that could cost him his life, also that they could expand their territory and influence. For now, we have reached one of the most important milestones in the life of a raider lord. 50,000 dinars in the bank. No longer are we merely financially independent, no. We are now a wealthy clan, I mean, their third had 47,000 before he gave most of it to me, so I could safely say that I am as rich as a king. But surely I could do better than this? Maybe, but for now, let us celebrate this accomplishment by heading into the nearest town. That's right, I no longer have to train my rogue skill to sneak in. I can now just walk in through the front gates and even access the local market, as well as the other important facilities that I couldn't access otherwise wearing a disguise. The first thing I was going to do in the town of Galend was sell some of the mules and cargo we stole from the people we've raided. That all came down to a total of 2600 dinars, but I'd likely have gotten more money if I didn't lose most of my inventory when I hastily retreated from those Vlandians a few days ago. After that sale, I went to the inn and slept in an actual bed for the first time in what feels like centuries. I nearly forgot what that was like. When morning arrived, I heard some cheering coming from the general direction of the local arena because of a tournament that just began. So what better way to celebrate the success of my acts of violence other than more violence? This time nobody would die because we were given blunted weapons which could still inflict a lot of pain. Anyway, I went in and apparently I could bet on myself. 
I see no reason not to do it. The bet cost me 150 and if I were to win, I'd get back 600 for this round, which isn't too bad. In the first round, I was given a sword and a shield, along with three teammates who all had different weapons. And we were faced with another team of four who had the same equipment. So I kept my shield high and proceeded to advance towards the footman. The biggest threat was the billman, who got taken out by a couple slaps of my sword. The next biggest threat was the crossbow man, but I couldn't get to him without removing the other swordsman from the competition. And once I loosened a few of his teeth, I finally approached the ranger, who didn't even have time to react and draw his sword before he found his face shoved in the dirt. But the other team still had a horseman whom I could only defeat with this billhook I just picked up. Unfortunately, I missed the strike that was intended for him and accidentally injured his horse. But before he got up, he got told to sit his ass back down, cause I'm the winner of this tournament. Then it was time for round 2, which was almost the same as round 1, except for the fact that the Bill Hooker got replaced by a second crossbowman. As long as I can block their projectiles, I'll be fine. In fact, one of the rangers turned his back on me and quickly got a taste of my sword, but he was still standing, and his teammate showed up to offer assistance. I couldn't possibly fight both of them with my back turned towards their archer. So I turned back and charged at him, giving him a quick slap before continuing to run away from the other two. After I took some distance and managed to keep all three enemies in front of me, that's when I tried taking them out. But that proved itself to be quite a difficult endeavor, mainly because my opponents were highly defensive, even the one without a shield, but eventually, the sharpshooter fell to my blade, with Gertland the Huntress kissing the pavement shortly afterwards. The last one I dealt with was the other crossbowman and he quickly fell after I dislocated his shoulder with one smack of my blunted sword. Because my teammates dealt with our fourth adversary, we all qualified for round three, which was a duel with bill hooks. Well, this sucks. Even if I could block an attack, it may be coming with such force to crush through my defenses and instantly take me out. So the only logical thing I could do was stay on the offensive. One schmack was all it took to qualify for the final round, which was another bellhook duel. This time, I wanted to play it safe, so I went to a nearby rock which may or may not impede my opponent's attacks. Even so, I had to strike first if I wanted to succeed. My opponent, however, did not instantly fall, and I was afraid that by the time I smack him a second time, I'd get insta-clapped. Fortunately, I did not, and that's how I won the Tournament of Galend. Well, calling it THE tournament may not be justified, because this is just one of many tournaments that took place in this town. But it is my first tournament, and what a victory! I went from being someone who terrorized the people of Vlandia and putting its inhabitants to the sword, to being someone who entertains their crowds. I don't know if the Ironborn Code forbids earning money through entertaining others with your combat prowess. I'm pretty sure it prefers using the fighting skill to kill others and take their stuff, but even so, the money I did earn from this tournament is from the smart bets I've placed on myself. In addition to that, I also received a javelin which is valued at 600 dinars, but this is all pocket change compared to what I have. Which reminds me, maybe I could get a bit more money for ransoming all these prisoners we're transporting. Well, 3500 is good enough, but what's even better than the money was the roguery experience I got from selling these boys to the hostage keeper. But despite doing this, along with raiding so many villages, I've barely reached level 47 in this skill. So if I want to be a competent gang leader, I'm going to need to find a more efficient training method. But while I'm in this city, I should also liquidate all the armor and weapons we took from those we've defeated over the past month. All in all, this gear brought me another 20k, which would undoubtedly have been lower if I were to sell it to caravans or villages. Before embarking on my next adventure, however, I paid a visit to the tavern, where I ran into the lass I defeated in the tournament and we struck up a conversation. She told me how her family got cheated out of their rightful lands, and how she joined up with a mercenary company that proved itself to be not much better than thieves. 
Eventually she decided to work for the highest bidder, which I happen to be. Well, she might have a problem with the fact that my crew are much worse than thieves. Anyway, she only asked for an upfront payment of 355 dinars, which I gave without hesitation because she's a much better navigator than I'll ever be, and her scouting skill will be vital to the mobility of our party. But there was one last thing I wanted to do in this town before I leave Vlandia behind for greener pastures. I've heard rumors of criminal gangs infesting the back streets, and because these are the only Vlandians I'm legally allowed to murder, I was curious to see whether their loot is better than what I can take from looters or sea raiders. The best way to provoke these thugs to a fight was to simply disrespect them, so that's what I've done. Then, using the nearby wall to my advantage, I made short work of them, despite their skill with one-handed weapons. But I did not get anything out of that. Apparently, I had to occupy that street corner until the local gang leader sent someone to check on the lads I just murdered. And once that finally happened, a few more thugs started to gather and prepared themselves for a fight. It took about a day for Voldemort to show up and confront me, and I was graciously given the option to surrender, but you already know that I can't. Even so, the criminals were approaching slowly, in order to scare us off and give us the opportunity to run away. But we stood our ground, and because we had the numbers, we won and took some interesting items from them, most peculiar of which was a bag of spice. Not a single one of my crewmates knew exactly what it was, except for the fact that it comes from the desert and is rumored to induce powerful hallucinations that can render the user insane. None of us had the courage to test that hypothesis, however, so for now, we'd be left to wonder. But there was one last thing that irked me. That 78.3 thousand gold doesn't look around enough to be in the final shot of this episode. So I entered the market and sold absolutely everything I could for another 1,677, so that the final amount of gold I'd have is 80,000 dinars, which is almost double the sum I was aiming to obtain today. And so, in just a couple of years after escaping the dungeons of Misea, Balon Blacktide went from being a bankrupt, naked, starving beggar, who had to subsist on whatever leftovers his captors threw at him, to becoming one of the most renowned raider bosses who's ever terrorized Calradia. Mostly Vlandia though, but his story is far from over and throughout his adventures, he's planning to befriend all peoples and cultures on this continent. But let's take this one step at a time, and the first step is to bring this chapter to an end. So anyway, thank you lads for joining me today, and I hope to see you in the next one. When is it coming? I don't know. For the moment, I'm working on a pretty massive guide and the editing on it is a bitch and a half. And until that video is finished, I'm afraid I don't have the space necessary to record a new Bandit episode. In a few weeks from now, that video should be published if no other problems arise. Maybe in the meantime, I'll also post shorter bits of content because that seems to be the new meta on YouTube, but that was all I had to say. Goodbye for now.